Greetings, Risk Five friends. Uh, so today is going to be shorter than usual. Uh, I'm not going to be actually doing any live work. So, you know, there is going to be just a bunch of uh, show and tell, I guess. Um, so you can see here, um, big schematic. Uh, so this is what I have been working on over the past few weeks. Uh, this is the sequencer base. So uh, if you want to know what that is, just, you know, watch the previous videos. Um, but I want to draw attention to some things here. Um, let's open up this small section. And we can see here, this is actually a comparator. And what I'm doing is uh, I'm just checking the instruction for uh, bad instructions. Uh, and there are two defined bad instructions. Uh, one of them is all uh, zeros, I think. Uh, and one of them is all ones in the lower 16 bits. Um, or no, one of them is all ones. It says so right up here. So one of them is all ones. And the other one is all zeros in the low 16 bits. And those are defined as bad instructions. So, um, now in TTL, there is a 74, uh, 688, which is an eight bit, uh, equality comparator. So you feed eight bits into it, uh, your eight bit signal, and then your eight bit, you know, it could be a constant, uh, and it'll output whether they are equal or not. Unfortunately, uh, we are using LVC. This is the low, uh, low voltage CMOS, the 3.3 volt version, and there is no 3.3 volt version of the 8-bit uh, equality comparator, pretty much because of market forces. Um, so there is a 688, it's just a 5-volt version. Um, in fact, let me uh, show you that. Let's see. So here is the 8-bit uh, magnitude slash identity comparator. Um, we're looking specifically at the 688. The 687 is the magnitude comparator. Um, and, uh, well, we can see that it's a, an LS. Um, and if you look through, you know, DigiKey or Mouser, this is all you get. Um, you don't get anything else. Um, and if we look down to the electrical characteristics, yeah, it's basically just a bunch of XORs. Um, we can see, let's see if I can... Make this a little bigger. Great, okay, so. Uh, supply voltage, nominal five volts, right? Min, uh, 150 millivolts below that, max 250 millivolts above that. So this is a five volt part. It's not meant to operate at 3.3 volt. You can't do it. Um, look at the input uh, high and low level voltage. So we have two is the minimum threshold for a high and 0.7 is the maximum threshold for a low. Now, if you feed a 3.3 volt logic signal into this chip, it will work um, because 3.3 volts come out um, and that's greater than two. So there you go, the input works. Um, and if you have a 3.3 volt chip that is five volt tolerant on its inputs, then you could feed the outputs of this chip to that 3.3 volt chip. And again, things will work. So this is one possibility is simply to use the five volt part. Um, let's take a look at the uh, speed of this part though. So if we go down here, um, it's, it's okay. I mean, it's not bad. Um, it It's showing, what, 12, maybe 17 nanoseconds, um, which is okay. So that's certainly one possibility to consider. Um, let's also, again, take a look at the schematic. So this, this was my uh, solution um, using only LVC parts. So we have this uh, open collector slash open drain um, buffer. Uh, the 07 is a buffer and the 06 is an inverter. And I talked about this uh, last time. And basically you tie all the outputs together. Now, because, uh, because this is open collector, you do have to pull it up uh, in case none of the outputs are um, 
in case all of the outputs are open collector, then the output is high instead of high impedance. Um, and then that gets fed to a gate over here. So there was a comment basically saying, yeah, that's not gonna work. Um, and they were pretty much correct. And let's see why. So let me pull up the data sheet for the 1G32. Okay, so here is the data sheet for the 1G32. And uh, first of all, just for fun, let's take a look at the uh, propagation delay on it. So propagation delay at 3.3 volts is um, typically 2.1 nanoseconds. So it's fast. Um, but what I really want to show is the input capacitance. So it says five picofarads. So let's do some math. Um, okay, so what we have is uh, our input and we have this going to 3v3 and it's 10k and it goes to the input of the chip which is five picofarads five picofarads let me use a uh, a white marker okay so the input comes in over here so essentially this looks like this. That's what an open collector output basically is. Either the switch connects the output to ground or the switch is open. So uh, if the switch is connected to ground, then the capacitor is pretty much immediately discharged or you know, as discharged as fast as uh, current can be drawn into the chip. Um, so that's pretty fast. So we expect to see something like this. Uh, how, however, when we open up the switch, well, the capacitor is going to charge through that resistor, and then we're probably going to see, you know, something like this. And the question is, well, when does it hit two volts? Because that's the threshold. So let's do some calculations. Um, so there is the voltage, and there is time. And let me just think. So the voltage is going to be equal to 3V3 times. And then what I usually do to figure this out is, um, I know that there is an E to the minus T over RC in here. And what I do is I say, okay, what happens when T equals zero? Well, when T equals zero, E to the minus zero is just one. So this is obviously wrong. So I might need to put a 3V3 minus that whole thing in there. Um, sorry, a one minus that in there. Um, that way, when t equals zero, e to the minus zero is one. One minus one is zero, so the voltage is zero. And then as t goes to infinity, well, e to the minus infinity is just zero. So 3v3 times one minus zero is 3v3. So this is the correct formula. That's how I do it anyway. I don't really memorize the formula. I just sort of like, you know, remember what the factors are and then I just figure it out from there. Okay, so um, let's, uh, let's um, say uh, R is 10 times 10 to the three, so that's 10K. And C is five picofarads, which is five times 10 to the minus uh, 12 farads. Okay. So we have V equals 3.3 times 1 minus E to the minus T over. Uh, let's just multiply these out. It's 50 times 10 to the minus 9. Okay. And I can just say 3.3, 1 minus E to the minus T over, uh, to the minus, um, so this is T times 0 0.02 times 10 to the ninth, just inverting that. So 150th is 0.02, 10 to the minus nine inverted is 10 to the ninth. Okay, so we wanna know when, what time that's going to equal two volts. So we have two equals this, so I can divide by 3.3, .3, equals one minus E to the T times 0 0.2, uh, um, 0.02 times 10 to the ninth. Okay, so now I can take the E factor, put it on one side and take this factor and put it on the other side just to get rid of the minus sign. So E to the minus T 0.02 times 10 to the ninth equals one minus two over 3.3, whatever that is. 
Now I can take the natural log of both sides, so we end up with minus t 0.02 times 10 to the 9th equals the natural log of this. And then of course I'm just going to divide by negative 0.02 times 10 to the minus 9. I guess that was kind of stupid to do the inversion because now I just have to do it again. So t equals uh, negative 50 times 10 to the minus 9 times the natural logarithm of 1 minus 2 over 3.3. Okay, let me take out my trusty RPN calculator and work this out. So we get 1 minus 2 over 3.3. Take the natural log, uh, natural log, it's negative, so I take the negative of that, multiply by 50, and times 10 to the minus 9, well, that's just nanoseconds, so this is equal to about 47 nanoseconds. So there you go. Um, when the switch opens up, it's going to take 47 nanoseconds for the, for the voltage to be high enough for that gate to register as a 1. Um, so compared to like, you know, a gate that switches in two nanoseconds or even, you know, a gate that switches in 12 or 17 nanoseconds, that's pretty slow. So what I could do is I could make this 1K and uh, the 1K is going to go into where? Um, the 1K is going to factor into here, which basically means that I'm just going to go 10 times as fast. So instead of 47 nanoseconds, now it'll reach the threshold in 4.7 nanoseconds, which is okay. Um, there are some other complications like, well, you know, we've got all these outputs tied together. And when the switch opens, um, I don't think, I think there's some like output capacitance uh, that gets in the way. So I really, really, really don't want to do this. So yeah, so that's, uh, that's the uh, kind of the bad part of this. So what I'm going to have to do is go into the schematic and look at all the places that I did this and replace it with my chosen solution. Now I said that one of the solutions was just using the 5 volt part and um, because a lot of the 3, 3v3 parts that I use are 5 volt tolerant already, uh, I don't have to worry about doing voltage conversions. Um, the 5 volt part will happily take 3v3 inputs and the 3v3 parts will happily take 5 volt outputs. So, um, so the other solution is something that was suggested. Let me just close this. So this is the ATF1502 ASV. It is a 3.3 volt part and it is a CPLD, a complex programmable logic device. So uh, let's talk about those for a moment. So uh, let me get rid of all of this. In the beginning, there were PALs, and these were programmable array logic devices. And what these were, uh, essentially, the simplest ones were just uh, what they call sum of products. So the idea is that you would have inputs in, 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 and you would be able to select either the positive or the negative of each of the inputs. So that's what that looked like. And then you would have um, AND terms. And the AND terms looked like this. So you would get a bunch of AND terms. I'll just draw, you know, four, a group of four. And in between each of these intersections would be a fuse that you could uh, that you could uh, blow or connect. The outputs of these, so these these are uh, what are called the AND terms. So I'm going to put a little AND gate at the end of each of these. And the idea is that for all the fuses that were blown here. Um, those signals would be anded together. So you could and, you know, the the um, the positive of one input, uh, nothing from the second input, the inverse of the first of, of the third input, and so on. Um, and the the macro cell 
would be basically a group of those with an OR gate at the end, just like that. Um, and you could possibly um, invert it. So let's just put an inverter here and, I don't know, do this. And that would be your output. So in this way, uh, you could do a lot of different logical functions and you were basically only limited by the number of AND gates that fed into an OR gate. Um, and there were some PALs which had more than others. Um, then there were other PALs which had registers at the end. So, you know, there would be a, uh, a register here, you know, maybe we'll call it a, a D flip-flop and there would be a clock line um, and that would be your output, you know, or maybe it would be Q not would be your output, you know, one of those. So, um, and that was pretty much the, the extent of it. Um, some PALs even allowed you to uh, fold back the, uh, the Q output back into this array, um, you know, with, of course, the negative, uh, so that you could sort of do little feedbacks and then you could, you know, make little counters or, you know, whatever. So that was that. Uh, then, um, and then the question is, well, okay, how did you program it? Well, you programmed it with, with high voltages um, and they literally blew fuses in there. Um, so they were one-time programmable, OTP, one-time programmable. Um, so there were also, for a brief period, peels. And these were programmable, electrically erasable um, array logics. Okay, so the idea here is that um, the fuses uh, were not permanently blown, so you could reset them electrically. Um, there were also uh, ultraviolet uh, versions of PALs that you could actually erase by just putting them into uh, an EEPROM eraser uh, with ultraviolet light. Eventually, there came the GAL, which was the generic array logic. And the generic array logic survives today in the form of the ATF uh, 16V8. No, I don't think they make those anymore. Uh, the 22V10, they definitely make. And I think that's probably all you could get. There may be a 20V8. What, this, what the numbering system means is that you have 22 IOs uh, and you can have 10 of those being inputs, uh, as many as 10. Uh, same, same thing here, you have 20 IOs. Well, okay, obviously they're not IOs. Um, yeah, okay, so, so there are 20 IOs. Not all of them are outputs. Uh, maybe the eight is the number of outputs that you get. I think that's what it is. Yeah, right, that's what it is. So for the, uh, for the 22V10, there are 22 um, pins, 10 of which maximum can be outputs. Uh, they can all be inputs. Uh, and basically, it's the uh, the usual sum of products array with registers on the end that are optional, um, with optional clear, uh, optional preset, I think. Um, there's a clock, there's an output enable. So there's a bunch of options for, for each of these so-called macro cells. So the 22V10 has 10 macro cells, the 20V8 has eight macro cells, and that's basically that. So after the gal, um, was wildly successful. Um, then there came ever more complex devices. So CPLDs are kind of next on the scale of complexity. These are the complex programmable, programmable logic devices. And for the most part, they're sort of like gals, uh, except they, they're kind of bigger. Um, they have more features. Um, and that's what the ATF 1502, 1504, and 1508 are. And that is the thing that I want to look at. What's next? Uh, the FPGA, the Field Programmable Gate Array. So this is like, you know, this sea of macro cells that have, you know, very complex uh, routes between them and, you know, all sorts of IO options. And, you know, it, it's like complex squared. So. Uh, so let's take a look at this uh, CPLD. So let me uh, show this thing again. Okay, so here's an example of a macro cell. So we can see 
that there are these five AND terms, and these are the same thing. Um, you can see here, uh, there's this little buffer si sim symbol with a, a bubble. So this is, you know, you can select the positive or the negative of this. And there are basically 80 lines that go across. So you have uh, 80 signals, that's 40 signals plus their inverts. Um, and you can add them all together. And, and here are these foldbacks as well. Um, there's one foldback here. There's a, they don't call it a foldback, but they call it a feedback. Um, this comes from an I.O. pin, so this is an input. This comes from, say, uh, the output of this XOR gate or the output of this flip-flop, and it can go back into the global bus. So basically, um, you can select any of those, you can AND them together, and then your function is programmed using fuses. Uh, your, your sum of products is programmed using fuses, and then there are the options in the macro cell. Uh, so here's an example, here's a view of the PLCC version, and this is the TQFP version. They have different pinouts, they're actually rotated. Um, so you can see the IOs around the edge. Okay, uh, this is the macro cell itself, uh, not the macro cell, this is, this is the overall view of the chip. Um, so you've got these buses, you've got a bunch of macro cells organized into blocks. Um, for the ATF-1502, there are 16 macro cells in block A and 16 macro cells in block B, so that's 32 macro cells. So, um, so at a maximum, that would be 32 computed outputs as compared to like the 10 that you would get in the 22V10. So this is obviously a bigger device. Um, Okay, uh, and they don't actually tell you how to program it because that's the secret squirrel sauce. Um, however, however, uh, White Quark uh, has put together a GitHub repository uh, which actually uh, explored what the fuses did because what you can do is you could take their crappy, you could take um, microchips crappy uh, uh, bitstream generation program um, and you can create bitstreams out of it. Or um, you could take the bitstream and you can start flipping bits and then just sort of analyzing what happens to the chip. Um, and uh, in this way, uh, White Quark was able to determine what fuses did what. Um, and I also made a bunch of diagrams to show what fuses do what. So now we have a way to program these chips using open source software. So things like um, NMyGen and, and Yosis and um, you know Python and that sort of thing without having to go through the crappy Windows only software which crashes all the time. Um, there are some limitations though. Um, you can get as far as defining the logic and then there's a gap, and then there's how to convert uh, that logic into fuses. Uh, that results in a uh, file that you can then um, write to the chip using a standard uh, JTAG connector. So there's that little gap that we have to that we have to jump. So let me show you how I'm going to do that. Um, so now I can finally show you this thing. All right. So this thing right here is a diagram of the 181 ALU. This is the first chip that I wanted to tackle because it would be probably the most complex chip that, um, that I would want to convert into a CPLD. Oh, and um, in terms of what, I'm, what my self-imposed rules allow me to put on these CPLDs. So, um, so you know that I've been using these you know, one gate chips um, so my, my self-imposed rules are, um, if something is ROM-like, then um, I can, no, wait. If something is a very large lookup table with lots of inputs and lots of outputs and they aren't separable, then I can convert that into a ROM. If something is a logic chip that should exist, but doesn't because of market forces, then I am allowed to, to 
substitute that one for one for a CPLD. So here's an example right here. Uh, the 181 is an ALU chip. It's not available in 3v3 form. But if market forces were slightly different and people were still using the 181, well, there would be a 74 LVC 181. There just doesn't happen to be one. So according to my rules, I'm allowed to take one 181 chip convert it into logic and program it into one CPLD. I'm not allowed to put any extra logic into the CPLD. I'm only allowed to implement the logic of this one chip. I'm not allowed to take, say, two 181s and stuff them into a single chip. So those are my self-imposed rules. Uh, so in effect, I'm basically saying, well, if there were a 3v3 version of the 181, this chip would be it. So, so that's that. Um, anyway, uh, in the data sheet of the 181, they're very nice. They very nicely laid out the logic of these chips. Now, if we look at this closely, you can kind of see that there are various levels here. <clears throat> so here we go. So this is one level, and you can recognize this as a sum of products. Yes, there is an inverter on the end, but basically there are all the AND gates. Here is some of the inputs are inverted, and there are the OR gates. So um, in the CPLD, this is basically one macro cell right here. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight of them. Now these XORs, um, although there are XORs in the macro cells, unfortunately, it's not easy to just you know take the OR gate plug it directly into the XOR, and then take another input and plug that into the XOR. It can be done, but it's a lot easier if you have the space to just reserve one macro cell whose function is only an XOR. So that's one, two, three, four more macro cells. Okay, so what's our total? 12. Okay, now we can see that the next level is again a bunch of sum of products. So here's a, uh, here's a product with really no sum, so it's one sum, right? So there's one, two, three, four, mm, there's five, and there's six, and there's seven. So we're up to, what is it, 19 now, I think? Then there are a bunch of more uh, XORs. So that's 20, 21, 22, 23. Um, here's another macro cell, so that's 24. And here's the final macro cell, so that's 25. All right, well, we have 32 macro cells in our chip and we've used 25, so it should work. Um, I'm not using any registers, so I don't have to bother about that complication. So uh, what I did was I was able to determine um, that if I could program this in NMyGen and basically uh, program each, each layer one by one, uh, there's a bunch of commands that you can use to generate uh, sum of products. And it looks something like this. Let's see if I can pull this up. So, yeah, okay. So here's an example of a PLA file. Um, and a PLA file basically specifies your inputs, your outputs, and the sum of products. So uh, each one of these columns down here, these things, okay, um, each one of those columns is one of these outputs. So the first bit here is your n carry out. The second bit here is your uh, a equals b. And the idea is that um, the and terms are all the ones or together. And these are your inputs. Uh, the dashes are don't cares. So in this particular case, n carry out consists of this one input needs to be zero or this other input needs to be zero. And you know, if you look at this gate right over here, well, that's exactly what it is. This one input is zero, this other input is zero, or them together, that's your output. 
Um, so I wrote a parser for this PLA, right? And again, the PLA file only represents sum of products. That's it. Um, let's see, do I have another one? Okay, so this is a special PLA file that I wrote. Um, and I added this uh, special function called .xor, which basically says this is not uh, a sum of products, this is an XOR. Um, and basically what I did was I said, okay, well, the XOR is basically the, the, the one in this column, and these are the two inputs. That's all you get because that's all I ever needed. So now I have PLA files, and I'll, I'll talk about converting nmygen into the PLA files in a moment. So now you have a bunch of PLA files, and uh, we can look over here uh, to see how we can actually uh, layer these. So you've got a bunch of inputs, and then you have a, an and or layer. That's your sum of products. Then the next layer is, is optionally a bunch of ands, but basically the XOR. So you can get the outputs of the previous layer and also any inputs. And then you just basically layer them until you reach the outputs and then you are done. Um, so I wrote a program that takes in all of these PLA files and basically uses the uh, Fuse database that White Quark has published in, uh, in the GitHub, which I will, if I can remember, uh, have a link to below, um, and basically converts it to an entire fuse map um, that I can then burn onto the chip using a JTAG programmer. So now the question is, well, okay, so how do you get from nmygen to the PLA file? So let's open up the code again and go to, um, I'm having a bunch of glare on the screen. Okay, that's a little better. ICs.py. Okay, so let's go to here. So we can see, see here that this is and or layer one. So here are the inputs. These are just the chips inputs um, or most of them. Uh, and basically this is the logic of uh, the first layer. Okay, and then I have this method called toRTL. Uh, it doesn't do any formal verification. All it does is um, elaborate the module and convert it to RTL. Okay, once it's in RTL format, how do we get it into PLA format? So let's see if I can show that. Let me pull up a uh, window. All right, here we go. So let's go to MNTF. Um, so basically what I do is, um, risk five reboot. So what I do is I run, okay, so what have I got as the main for this file right now? Okay, I've got and or layer three, that's fine. We'll do and or layer three. So what I do is I run ICs.py in RTL mode. Um, and what that does is it gives me this top level.il file. So the first thing that you do, the first thing that you do is you <clears throat> run it through, um, what do you do? You run it through Yosis with this command line, minus p synth, minus o, and then a blif file, uh, which I think stands for block level information file or something like that, and you give it top level, top level .il. So it goes ahead and it does something. Um, again, I'm not really sure what the blif file has in it. But if you look at it, it has something to do with the logic. Okay, so there's there's some stuff in there. The next thing that you do is you run Yosis ABC. And what you do is you do read read blif. So you read the blif file, 181L3.blif. And then you call collapse. What collapse does is it turns it into a sum of products. And then you write PLA. Um, I'm just going to write a.pla, and then you can exit. 
or you can quit. Okay. So if we look at a.pla, well, that's the PLA file that we saw before. So the other, uh, the XOR layers, um, I just, you know, wrote it myself because it's, you can see that the format is pretty straightforward. Um, there's also an output layer. So if we look at uh, 181out.pla, uh, what I did was I said, okay, let's just define this, this parameter called .outputs. That basically says all of these output blocks, those are the output of the chip. Uh, those are the outputs of the chip, and that's it. Um, so I wrote a Python program to basically read all these files in um, and convert them to a fuse map. Um, the way you convert it into a fuse map is that there's a utility that White Quark wrote that uh, will take a template file, which is essentially a blank file for uh, an ATF-1502 chip. Uh, it's a blank fuse file. Um, and then you basically say, you know, set this fuse, set that fuse. And it's, uh, it's nice because uh, it's symbolic. So you can say, you know, set this fuse name or this macro cells feature to that setting. Um, and basically my Python program just outputs those settings, those set commands. Um, the result is a file that you can then program using JTAG. Um, and that's it. Now I haven't actually done that yet, but uh, that's, that's the next stage. Um, so, so with that, um, what I decided to do is to take um, the 181 and convert it into a CPLD. And I also want to take the 688 and convert it into a CPLD as well. And then I can just pop that into the circuit instead of, you know, doing this, this crazy stuff that I've been doing that probably won't work anyway. Um, yeah. And that's really all I wanted to talk about today. So like I said, bit of a short video, you know, not much live programming or live schematicking or anything like that, but, um, this is a, uh, a decision that I've made, and uh, that's uh, what's going to happen uh, going forward. Now, hopefully, uh, by next week, I will have all the hardware that I need to actually program one of these CPLDs and test it. Uh, so we can see that it is actually doing uh, either the ALU functionality or the, uh, the uh, comparison functionality. And then we can use those in our schematic. So I guess that's it for now. Um, thanks for watching, and I hope to see you all next week. Bye!